Hi, I'm Chip Hardwick. I'm the Synod Executive for the Synod of the Covenant, and I want to welcome you to this monthly preaching workshop. We're so excited to have Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown with us today. I will have a chance to introduce her more fully in just a second, but I'm glad for all of you who are watching and participating live and all of you who will be watching this later. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm gonna to open our time together in prayer. Gracious God, you call us to lead your people in all sorts of ways, and one of those ways is to preach faithfully and effectively, and we thank you this morning, oh God, for the chance to learn more about um, how we can do that, how we can serve you, and how we can serve your people. So God, send your spirit. We thank you so much for Dr. Fray Brown's presence here and all that we will learn from her. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to, um, of course, as you know, if you come to anything where I am, I can't resist a good PowerPoint. And I'm not sure if this is a good PowerPoint, but it is a PowerPoint. So I'm going to share my screen and um, bring you up to date on some things going on at the Senate, and then we'll start our time together. Um, do you see Paula or Anne or Julie? Do you see the slideshow that's up? All right, great. Thank you. And the first thing I wanted to let you know is that we had about, I think, 60 people applying for the higher education scholarships, and we will be letting the winners know by the end of June. Um, these are scholarships for vocational school students, for um, associate's degrees, uh, um, bachelor's degrees, and their first theology master's, and we look forward to giving out probably around $40,000 towards these scholarships. Um, we also have um, a, something that I'm really excited about. I wanted to make sure you, it was on your radar because it will start in the middle of the summer, towards the end of the summer. I don't know how many Presbyterian meetings we'll have between now and then, but we're working with LeaderWise to offer adaptive leadership cohorts. It's kind of a practicum where um, all the participants will come once a month. It's um, the first, it's August the 4th is the first one. So it's the first Thursday of the month or something, um, all for four months. And you'll come together and have a chance to learn about what does it mean to lead in particularly challenging situations. And then you will be in a cohort group where you can talk with other people about your specific situation and what you plan to do in the next month. Then you'll come back the next month and talk about what progress you made and what you wanna do in the next month. You'll learn some more. And it's really gonna be, I think, a very helpful program that's totally paid for by your presbytery and your synod. And you can invite as many people as you want from your church. You could do the cohort group in your church if you wanted, um, or you could come by yourself, but it's, it's for anyone that wants to attend, not just pastors or commissioned ruling elders. Also coming in September is a program called It's Not Just Sundays, Hybrid Church Growth and a New Normal, looking for how to complement our in-person ministries with effective virtual ministries. Um, the, main, the main workshop will be on September 15th at 6.30 p.m. There's also a session for beginners, um, tech beginners, though the week before and one for more advanced people the week after. And you can find information about this on our website, it's um, with the Reverend Dr. Javon Caldwell-Gross. We've got our Matthew 25 grants program coming up. The um, applications aren't due until September, but keep those in mind. And then I wanted to let you know that we are searching now for a half-time position for a coordinator of Synod Communities of Color. This would be a person who would use community organizing techniques to help build community and um, build um, coherence within, the, within and among the communities of color in the Synod of the Covenant. Often in presbyteries, there's not critical mass of any of these um, communities. And so we're looking to create critical mass um, along the Synod. And um, this position will probably be about a year long in the the idea is that they will help encourage communities to come together, figure out what kind of ministry they want to do together, um, figure out how the Synod can learn from them and support them. And um, that, that we'll probably start interviewing people in early July. So if you know somebody that would be interested in that, have them contact me. We've got um, Dr. Fry Brown today. I'll tell you a little bit more about her in a second. We, we will not have a workshop in July. And then in August, Kim Wagner from the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago will be leading on preaching in the wake of trauma. Then Sally Brown, who's recently retired from Princeton Seminary on Sunday's sermons for Monday's World. 
I'll be leading one in October on Preaching for Advent 2022. And then Luke Powery of Duke University will be leading one on Preaching in the Valley of Dry Bones in November. So I hope you'll mark your calendar. Those are the first Wednesdays of each month from 10 to 1130. The best way to learn about ministries like that is through our newsletter. You can subscribe if you don't already have it to senatorthecovenant.org slash subscribe. You can also find and follow us on Facebook or on YouTube. And here's my information. I'll put that in the chat in case you'd like to get in touch with me directly. I want to introduce you. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown. She is the um, 14th historiographer of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She is a um, the first tenured Black female professor at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University, where she is the Bandy Professor of Preaching. She's also only the third Black female full professor at Emory University. She served as the Director of Black Church Studies at Candler from 2007 to 2015. She has her PhD in Religious and Theological Studies from the Iliff School of Theology and the University of Denver with an emphasis on religion and social transformation. She is um, a very impressive woman and a legend around Candler School of Theology, where I received a THM, and I, it, although it was in preaching, I never had a class with her, which makes me so disappointed that I didn't get to study with her, so she seemed like a great person to invite to give one of these lectures. So, Dr. Fry Brown, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for coming with us. Let's give her some happy hands to welcome her to our time together. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am very happy to be here and see all your wonderful faces, and since we're talking about images, good image, good energy this morning. Uh, when I do lectures, I don't just talk because our attention span is at best about 10 minutes. And so I'm probably going to be talking. Uh, we use the chat box if you have questions as I'm going along so I'll know what's going on. I will also be asking you from time to time to enter things into the chat box if you have access to that. We may break up into very small groups to do a couple of exercises in the latter part of the presentation. Uh, and I'm good for stopping at any time without questions. I've been teaching preaching for forever. And so I get real excited about it. So if I start running too fast, just wave your hand or I won't be able to see it. Put it in the chat and say, could you please just calmly do that? All right, and we'll be very good. And if I don't know the answer, I'll send you to a book someplace that you can find the answer. And that's the way I work, okay? So we're going to, I think I still have, I have the capacity already. Uh, share my screen. Um, and uh, what I want, can you see, everybody can see the screen, I hope? Good. Uh, I've been teaching online for the last four years. And so sometimes I have it down and sometimes I don't. And, and so what I want to talk about today is um, the power of illustration. I, I think that sometimes our preaching is very flat and very um, unidimensional because we don't consider the, the illustrations. We can do brilliant exegesis. We can have the forms, all 1000 forms down in our sermons, but something is missing. And so what I want to talk about when we consider how saturated our brains are in these days with images, some that are very depressing, some that are very enlivening. I heard someone talk about grandchildren when we were coming on. I have a three month old grandson. And so that's a good image for me when he's cuddling. And then I have to turn around and watch the news. And what happens sometimes is if we're not uh, paying attention to things around us, we may miss wonderful images. And so this is also a way where we do not have to resort to going to a book of images and illustrations uh, using some that we used 25 years ago. I know none of you do that, but sometimes I'm listening to students and they're doing 1901 images and people have no connection to it whatsoever. When we consider that um, some 300 million images are uploaded each day with some um, 3.9 something million people who may be using social media per day. Um, 
what kinds of ads, what kinds of images, what kinds of colors, what kinds of movements uh, are we paying attention to? So let me start with attentiveness. Attentiveness, we know, is where we we are, are using all of our capacities. And we understand that some of us have different learning channels. Some of us respond to auditory things, some to visual things, some to, kin to kinesthetic. Some of us have to touch. So I'm going to be talking about the importance of multi-sensory input for earthing a sermon, for giving us really good kinds of things to look at. So our attentiveness is uh, affected by our attitudes, our intuitions. It may be our personality, what we choose not to pay attention to. I have this piece about the attention span being at max um, 40 minutes for some people. We understand that what passes for television entertainment is about 20 minutes and then commercials. What we do are commercials. Sermons are commercials. And sometimes we miss the product, which is how we get to a point of salvation because we have illustrations that don't match or no illustrations or too many, or we do a joke for 45 minutes and then we have a five minute sermon, or we tell a story that we say is our favorite story but our head is down and we're reading it. And so people don't know if it's really a story that we like. And um, we can um, override the biblical text with too much of an illustration or we can wipe out the biblical text, right? We can have it consumed by what we think. Our attentiveness is affected by our age, our experience, our education, all kinds of pieces like that. I grew up in a family, I'm the second oldest of seven. So I grew up in noise and that's not even counting pets and other people that showed up. And so my late husband, also was from a large family, but he was the youngest one. So he liked silence. So our household was quite interesting. So I had a room where I could play music and write and everything, and then he'd be quiet someplace else. And so our attentiveness, think about what you need in order to pay attention, what kind of setting you need in order to pay attention. And this also goes, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a second. It also goes to uh, when, some people uh, can't pay attention to what's right in front of them because they're looking all around them. So also kind of think about what keeps your attention? What holds your attention? Do you need all the big lights or you just need a whisper? Like the biblical text says, I look for God in the fire and the flood and, and it was in the, he was in the small, still small voice. So think about that also when we're talking about how one uses illustrations and images in sermons. We also know that our attention, when I talk about the embodied nature of it, um, are we attending to the text? Are we pointing people to, are we are aware of the listening community? Uh, even though we've been, many people have been online consistently the last two or three years, uh, one of the things I found difficult in teaching is those little boxes sometimes are blacked out and so I started paying attention to the blacked out boxes, not the people's faces, because I was wondering what in the world they were doing while I was trying to teach, right? My whole ego was involved. I know yours is never involved, but my ego got involved. Like, hey, I'm working here. Can somebody pay attention, right? And so sometimes when we're preaching, we start attending to the person who doesn't seem to be paying attention to us and we forget everybody else. Um, the world around us is so replete with illustrations. I'm sitting right now facing across the street from my house, which is only trees. And so sometimes I need a break from what's right in front of me and I go and look at that. Sometimes people you are preaching with are looking at their phones. They're probably Googling what you're saying because people do that regularly now, right? To make sure that you actually studied. Um, and people think they're doing other things. They may be watching games, I don't know. Uh, but what, what about me? What kinds of illustrations come from Teresa's life, from Teresa's understanding of who she is, from Teresa's understanding of the biblical text. This doesn't mean that you give your testimony and you're the greatest person that ever lived all the time. It just means, what do I see? What, what, what do I understand? What do I feel? What do I believe? So when I'm reading the biblical text, 
and the illustrations are coming, that's exegesis by the way, when the illustrations are coming up to me, how does that connect with who I am? This becomes very important. So I always say to people, when we prepare the sermon, when we prepare to use illustrations, exegete yourself, exegete yourself. Um, watching the images over and over and over again as we do when there's an, uh, a publicized national tragedy. Sometimes I, get, I go down rabbit holes and I can't pull myself out. And if I have to preach, I have to walk away from the television and turn off everything so I can then relate to the biblical text and not bring all of those images into the sermon that do not belong there, okay? For that particular sermon. You already know this piece. Uh, because I was speech language pathologist for 150 years, I also do a lot with, with this kind of thing too. Uh, the, the, the person, the preacher, when I was talking about me, uh, what's your self-concept? What is your culture? What are your attitudes about things? What are your feelings? What are your expectations of the preaching moment tells you about what illustrations you're going to use? Um, and then there's this whole, on the other side is the receiver. Do you, are you pastoral in knowing even over in hybrid situations or, or on screen, do we know something about the cultures and the skills and the understandings? I, I, I don't know if you've ever listened to a sermon where somebody starts talking about a movie they saw and the assumption is everybody saw it and they're just rolling with the movie and people are like looking blank or, they, or, or a song or whatever the latest thing is, but there's a pastoral piece in selecting illustrations also. Knowing your people well enough to know if this is going to trigger something. And, and there's, this is not a perfect science, but being pastoral enough to know those. And then between the preacher and the congregation or the listener are all these other kinds of things in the feedback loop, the noise that's there the things that are interfering, the things that when you show up and they spend more time looking at your person than what's coming out of your mouth, right? Uh, what happened before, where you are preaching. Uh, the number of preachers that I worked with that had to move from the in-person preaching to then preaching online, some of them thought they couldn't preach anymore. Part of it had to do with they had no content before, so we had to work on their content so they didn't know what to do. Uh, but working on that inter, inter, the, the, the intermediary area between the preacher and the receiver, the context, the noise, the interference, how it's being uh, related and know that those go back and forth in this wonderful thing called a feedback loop. Uh, I think I will not do this right now. Uh, I will. In that center part that you see right here where it's talking about message, I've talked enough about the listener. These affect what kinds of illustrations you're using as does the receipt, okay? But right here, your text is the first stop for an illustration. The text is the first, the, the, the words, the wording, I, I'm, whatever translation you use, the, the text itself can give you an illustration even down to the, the, the um, placement of a period or a comma or a question mark can give you an illustration. I've, I've preached a whole sermon on punctuation because sometimes that's critically important and that was illustrative, right? Uh, because I love language, that's this word. The liturgical season, as you already know, as we approach Pentecost, gives you illustrations already that you don't have to run and look up somebody else's illustration. You don't have to borrow somebody else's or plagiarize somebody else's illustration. The length of the sermon tells us what kind of illustrations we're going to use. Uh, so that we're not stacking, 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 that we're supporting. An illustration throws light on, it does not diminish in any way. And, uh, I don't know if I'm admitted people, but I will. I saw the admit light come up. I just, that was a reflex action right there, right? Uh, the genre of the text can give you beautiful illustrations. I, uh, my students often avoid preaching genealogies. I happen to believe that you can find a sermon in a genealogy just like you can in wisdom literature, right? Um, the medium, of course, is where you're preaching, how familiar you are with the text and the people and the illustration, and the illustration. When I said, when people say, this is my favorite story and they read it the whole time. 
this reminds me of a song and then you can't remember the song. And I understand as I mature, I may forget some of the song, but write it down for God's sake, right? And your humor, making sure that your humor is actually humor. Because what's funny to the preacher sometimes is not funny to the listener. And so the joke falls flat. Or, or if you say things like, this is, good, this is really funny. So you're setting yourself up for failure when you say, this is really funny. Because what's funny to me may not be funny to you, may not be funny to the congregation. The emotional state that a preacher, a preacher enters with, and I think it's always very interesting that sometimes the perception when I've done work with the listeners, the perception is that the preacher has no emotion or the preacher has two emotions. It, the, the humanity of the preacher begins to be uh, diminished because of the way sometimes people view who preachers are, or they think they're that the, the panting, very ag aggravated, running around holding up your Bible kind of preacher. I'm gonna leave that alone because I don't know you well. So all of you may be doing that right now. So I don't want to embarrass anyone by calling that out. Okay, um, I did the emotion. Okay. We also know that our illustrations are also related to uh, certain signals that come up, um, the encoding of certain words, the, 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 the nonverbal cues that come when we're talking. There are persons who, um, they watch your, your face becomes critically important. When people say things like, I'm so glad to be here, but they say, I'm so glad to be here. It already tells the people what the rest of the sermon is going to be like, okay? Beginning with an apologetic. Uh, so your facial expressions, I'm gonna talk about that, your body language. You can see, I use my hands a lot because I was a speech language pathologist and we have to use our hands. I used to do sign language. So as long as I'm not doing this all over the place, which distracts, that's part of the illustration which distracts from it. And you can't figure out if I'm bringing airplanes in or what I'm doing, right? So we also have to watch what our bodies are doing when we're doing these kinds of things. And um, the relationship that you have with the listeners also impacts what they're able to see when you're talking. I mean, if you've ever been in a relationship with someone and you don't, they, you don't have to finish the sentence, they pick it up. And so sometimes when you start using an illustration, the people know you well enough to know or, or anticipate where you're going. They can anticipate by what your face does. They, they can anticipate by the tenseness of your body. Um, when I am preaching, my students have told me that when I'm teaching or preaching and the right side of my mouth goes up, I'm getting ready to make a transition. So sometimes people watch your bodies enough to know that. Uh, that when I'm really um, animated about something, I do a shoulder roll, which means I'm going toward the end of the sermon. Um, that sometimes if I'm really intense about something, I put my hands on top of my head. I didn't know I did this, but I watched the video and I do it. And so they begin to anticipate what you're illustrating, even when you lack the words. So your body becomes the illustration. Your, you, what you do with your glasses become the illustration. And that, I know none of you do this, but this thing that people do when they keep looking at their watch as if they're really going to stop, you know what I'm saying? Um, or they take their watch off and put it down. That illustrates that you, you're trying to say, I'm going to command this space, but we also know that you're probably not going to be truthful about what's going to happen, okay. So active attentiveness, one of the best tools for a preacher is silence. Because we talk all the time and sometimes we just need to stop talking and pay attention to what's going on, what's going on in the worship service. And I know that sometimes preachers write these phenomenal manuscripts. This is the best sermon they're ever going to preach. And by God, you're going to listen to every word instead of paying attention to the people to know when to back away from it and change something else and insert something else. Um, I know it's difficult for people to relax sometimes, but in the preaching moment, that first one or two minutes where we're very tense, 
people can also understand things better when we're not as forceful or tight at what we're trying to relate. Um, it's hard to limit distractions I know around us. Um, I may say this a little bit later, but when I said something about attitudes, in illustrations, we need to check our own prejudices and the language that we use to describe something. The tone that we use, the volume that we use, the way we use repetition, the words we select are all vitally important for illustrations. So when, when we say check our own prejudices, um, the way we language other people, we need to ask people how they want to be referred to. We, we need to uh, uh, try to, uh, to say the woman with the issue of blood is better than to say the sick woman. So we did her humanity first and then we do descriptors. Do we understand what I'm saying? Somebody, I can see some heads, right? And, and so in, in like manner, when I was growing up, my grandmother referred to herself as colored. Uh, I'm a child of the 60s, so I had the big Angela Davis fro and the gaucho pants and a hat, and I'm, I'm out doing my black powers. So we had a difference of opinion, but I understood when I talked to my grandmother, I could not say black because she would stop listening. So we have to think about what words we use, what phrases we use that become, I may say this later, uh, an, il uh, an illustration embolism which means sometimes there are words we select that people can't get past and they stop and don't hear the rest of the sentence, right? It's understanding that I may be of one political party, but I have people in my congregation that are other political parties. And so if I just talk about or demean one, I have now set up a barrier with reception of the word of God, which comes before the illustration. Hmm. Okay. The theme that, that whatever the liturgical season and what I'm supposed to be addressing comes in the illustration casts light on the text, but it doesn't wipe out the text or have people, it, it's, it's people talking about love and they're angry all the time, right? That, 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 that's, a, that's cognitive dissonance set up with what that illustration is supposed to be. We know that when we talk about illustrations, they're very graphic ones, which are pictures, and designs, they're optical things which mirror sometimes what's in front of us. There are these uh, sensory data that's always there. Those are perpetual kinds of images, mental images that we can pull from dreams and memoirs and ideas and our imagination. The best tool that I think preachers have after listening is imagination. And it's been very interesting to me to these last, particularly these last maybe 15 years, to have younger people in that have no imagination. And I will, I will ask them to think through something and they get stuck because there's so many images coming at us. And there's so many uh, experts that they don't think through what they see in the text and they can't formulate things in terms of, of what ifs. They're kind of stuck. So I have to do all these exercises to get them to even to dream dreams, to come up with, with uh, ideas about what's in the text, to mine the text, to connect with the people that will be listening to them. Uh, verbal images, of course, you all use similes and metaphors and descriptors, so I don't have to do that. And um, these are all important to, as how we begin to construct illustrations. Um, I mentioned those nonverbal cues and I probably, I don't think I'm going to use this now. I know you're probably very interested in it, but this, the nonverbal cues when I was talking about the eye contact, if you're going to sell an image, look at the people you're talking with. I understand there are cultures where you can't look people in the eyes, but the people I'm seeing on the screen, most of you can do eye contact, right? Without any kind of penalty. But the, the osculesis is the eye contact. It is to look to see what the interaction is if people are picking up on what we are saying. 
if they're receiving all the information. Um, kinesthetics is, I've talked about that, the way our bodies move when we're doing the illustrations. If you're a person that grips the pulpit or now grips the mouse, since you're doing things online, uh, <laughs> uh, then sometimes the tension shows. Not everybody uses their hands, but your voice can give the movement. Your voice can give the coloring and the tone of the um, illustration. So that's the vocalics part of it. Uh, we don't need to do the proxemics right now because uh, many of you might be online, but I think it's in, let me just park right here. When we are in person, those of you who are in person, um, using people for illustrations is a tinderbox. Uh, I don't know if you've ever watched people, some, you see these wonderful videos online where somebody calls somebody up and all of a sudden they make them a tree, right? Or you're gonna be the wagon or you're going to be Jesus or you're gonna, you know, that's lasting a lot for people to come up and be Jesus for your illustration. So when you're going to do these illustrations, make sure that you have some approval from the listener as to how close you can be to them and if you can touch them because that destroys the illustration if somebody's jumping. Uh, and I'm, I'm never quite sure why people think they have to use other people for illustrations, but that's for a whole nother workshop. Um, and um, the haptics have to do with, uh, do you use formal kinds of language in your illustration? Is there some kind of vernacular that you use? Um, how close, of course, the, the chromatics is how, how body rhythms. Think through your body rhythms and how you do things. I don't think I'm gonna use this one, so we'll pass this one. Okay. Uh, okay. When I said we have to be very interested or attend to the culture in which we are using an illustration, uh, and I said, know the behavior, watch art. All of us can do microaggressions. So we have to be careful. This is this box right here. Uh, how we stereotype uh, uh, persons with disabilities or genderized uh, stereotypes, uh, how we use our language, how technology affects the illustrations that we're using. Uh, there are persons sometimes that use, and I'll do a piece on movie clips later on, but uh, do we vet that little clip that we want to use before we stick it into the sermon? How do we go into saying, and here's something that, that might help us and how you come back out of it? Uh, are you using clips that are so graphic that people can't get back to the word, right? Um, awareness of the history of the use of that particular illustration uh, is it a fresh illustration? Um, when someone, um, and I say this to my students, but you all don't do this, I'm sure. Uh, when there's an event that happens um, in the world, sometimes preachers want to play the clip of that in their sermon. And uh, I asked them, my, my experience is one should wait to use a clip of something that just happened because the way that things can be changed and manipulated now, you may not have the right clip. You may not have the entire clip. You may have somebody has posted something and you're running with it and may have nothing to do with it or people can't adjust digitally anything. If you're using a piece of art, do a little bit of explanation about the art before you go forward with it. So I'm going to come back to that. Um, I don't know how much you, Oh, this is going to be recorded. So somebody, you, you can go back to this, right? Thank you very much, Chip. Okay. When I talked about our imagination, um, we have resources for illustrations based on listening to other people, but also in our traditions. There are wonderful illustrations. When we talk about conventional imagination in our hymns, in the prayers, in the tradition of the church. You don't have to go anywhere else. It fits because people in our particular context know those words. 
and you can do beautiful things with poetry that match what you're talking about in the biblical text. Uh, empathetic kind of imagination is, can we place ourselves in someone else's shoes? I don't mean literally, but can we imagine what's going on in the minds? One of the things that one can do when working with a biblical text is, if I were, this is a very easy one. If, if I were in the upper room, because we do understand, although it doesn't name them, there had to be some women hanging out in the upper room. So I just want to know I was there. I just want to say that. Uh, if I were in the upper room, what was going on while I'm sitting and waiting? If I were there. So I'm not describing the upper room. I'm talking about my experience in the upper room, right? I, I, I'm, I'm listening. And what happens when the wind starts blowing? What happens when the fire is above their heads? So you, you, you move to being a first person instead of a second person in the illustration, right? Placing yourself in someone's shoes. The other thing you can do with an emphatic information is ask people what it was like instead of assuming what it was like. Uh, it, it's this thing that, that we do in, it, as pastors sometimes is we say, I know how you felt. Well, I really don't. But I can imagine, were I in that spot, this may be how I am feeling, I would feel. That's emphatic imagination. Visionary imagination is to be able to see and respond to new things. Sometimes our illustrations are about things that didn't happen yet. That's why I love the book of Revelation and some people run away from it. But, but what, what kinds of things do in, in, in my mind, based on my faith, and I'm reading the text, do I imagine God is doing even though it's never been written before? So that's your, that's your visionary imagination, okay? Um, the moral imagination has to do with um, how I can envision a physical presence of freedom. Uh, it's empathy when we are setting with someone, we're doing a eulogy. That's part of the moral imagination. Uh, to overcome the past and how we're moving forward. Uh, it's wisdom. Those kinds of things come into moral imagination when I'm working with them. So we're going to what do we see and what we don't see. We can't see everything in the biblical text. And unless we are, and this is my own hermeneutic, unless I'm God, I can't see everything that you see. So I can only give you this part and a little bit about what I imagine is under the surface. But I'm not going to hit everything. I think too often preachers try to illustrate everything in the text and everything that ever happened. And then it's heavily weighted uh, with illustrations and not what we need when we are in fact about to preach. Okay. Multi-sensory interrogation of the text. If we're going to be working with illustrations, and creating your own illustrations, I ask that the preacher consider, what do I see? That's the visual part when I'm reading that text or I'm reading the context. What am I hearing, right? What are the sounds in the text? What are the sounds that aren't mentioned? We're back at imagination. Can I imagine what a drop of blood sounds like? The gustatory is the taste. What do I taste in the text? I'm going to do that in just a bit for you. I will, we'll work on these going throughout the rest of what I'm doing. The gustatory, that what's the taste in the text? When we talk about something like the salt of tears, right? that's a taste. Uh, if people are receiving information in these different, uh, everybody has different learning models. So, when we're doing an illustration, I think that the illustration should have seeing the visual, the auditory hearing, the taste gustatory, olfactory, what is the smell in the text? What does blood smell like? We're doing these things about crucial. What does what the blood smell like, right? What does hope smell like? Mm. Okay, uh, tactile, if I could touch something or feel something, that gives you a different kind of illustration. And then the kinesthetic is the movement. So we have seeing and hearing and taste and smell and touch and movement, okay? Um, right where you are, 
I see someone, Joe, John, has, has a pen on his mouth. So I want everyone to pick up whatever you're, you're holding at. And I want you to think about what does the pen look like? All right, you're looking, some of you are looking at your pen, some of you are, all right, I got you. John, look at your pen. There we go, thank you so much, all right. What is the pen, is, is there a sound associated with your writing device? Is there a click or something? So then it would be, it's the click sounds like, or when I put it on the paper, what does it sound like? Okay, while I'm writing, what kind of sound am I making? with the pen. And so we do looks like, right? It sounds like. Uh, what does that pen taste like? Because a lot of us do this with our pens. They must be very tasty because we rest them on our mouths, right? So what does the pen taste like? Okay. What does the pen smell like? Okay. And when you touch it, what are the what do you feel? What does it feel like when you're touching it? And does the pen move on its own or must it have assistance? So that's kinesthetic. Ah, I see Anne is, is doing this with her pen, right? Okay, this is what we're gonna do with multisensory all the way through. So I'm gonna be asking you these questions and I may have you put some things in the chat, but I think about what it, what, when we look at it, what do we see? What do we hear? How does it taste? How does it smell? If we touch it, what's the tactile dimension of it? And how does it move? We got those six. I know there's some other ones, but we're gonna just deal with these six, okay? All right. All of you scientific people know that there's some other ways that we do senses, but we're gonna do these right now. All right, when we look at this picture in the chat, I want you to put down what you see. Are we using the chat? Let me pull up the chat so I can see if my people are doing it. I see two things in the chat. Anger, thank you, force. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. Thank you. If you could touch this, what are the textures that you think if you could touch this? What are the textures? Put those in there. Oh, protection, that was good. Silky, thank you. Cold plaster. Mm -hmm. Okay, springy, all right. Flat, but looks 3D, good. And what, what put in, what kind of movement you imagine is supposed to be being depicted in this? Rough beard, thank you. What kind of movement, flowing? Okay. okay, floating, thank you. Freedom, all right. What do you think the temperature is in this picture? Taking all the space, okay. What, what do you think the temperature is if you were part of that? Warm, okay. Okay, cold. What sounds do you think are taking place in this scene? Harsh voice, okay. Thank you. Michelangelo would be very happy we're talking about sound, I think, okay? All right, all right, thank you very much. Do you think there is a biblical text that could be associated with this picture? If so, what would that be? All right, Garden of Eden, expulsion. All right, creation and host, thank you. All right, Garden of Eden is winning. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, the Job and the whirlwind. Okay, all right, all right, all right. There are times when um, on a screen, I would put, there are people that would put this picture up to begin that sermon with that text. I would not leave it up the whole time because guess what? While you're preaching, people will be so fascinated by that picture that we do just what I just asked you to do, right? Jonah, we got Jonah now. And the water and the sea of regions, yes. 
Okay. And Job's got a thumbs up. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go to the next one. I want you to put down the first thing you think when you see this picture. Patriotism, Black Memorial Day, the coming years of ashes, Memorial Day. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. Great country. Okay. America is good. Um, what do you hear when you see that picture? Wind, rustling. against the pole. Okay, thank you. This is going to be a, a, um, biblical text. Oh, it slowed down, huh? Nobody is writing in the chat. There we go. <laughs> okay, give to Caesar, okay. If my people, all right. Oracles against nations, nations, nations. Okay, okay. All right. This is an easier one. What do you see? Okay. Chaos. All right. All right. Love and hope. Movement. Okay. What do you hear when you see this picture? Christmas. Okay. All right. What do you smell when you see the picture? <laughs> All right. All right. I'm glad. I'm glad. Sweet uh, sweetness made it in with all the other the diaper references. I'm glad that that hit right there. Biblical text. Mm. Oh, the animals two by two. All right. Okay. So we're going from babies to this one. First thing you see. Eight. Okay. Okay. Fear. Sorrow. Okay. Okay. Movement. Oh, very good, John. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. And what's my next question? Text. Mm. All right, I'll let you rest for a minute. That was good, you did very well. A is for everybody and you get an A, you, okay. All right, so um, reading, 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 reading for illustrations, read, read widely, listen widely. We know about listening to people. Um, in the chat, I want you to put the last song you listened to. The last song you listened to. Kimberly Lamar in my file. Right, sounds decided to go. Okay, I like this group. I really like this group. When I asked this in seminary classes, they they put Jesusy songs first, and I kept and I think you know you didn't listen to that first, but <laughs> but considering this is that pastor move, listen widely. Many of us, uh, you will find in terms of, I'm not supposed to do something on language today because my, my area is delivery, but 
what you listen to the most often, your speech pattern develops that way. So just, and your preaching pattern will go with the songs. So this is good, okay? Um, and, and, and listen, and if you only listen to one type of music, please listen to another. I, I, I grew up in the 60s. And so I do a whole lot of other kind of R&B kind of stuff, jazz, but I have to listen to country music just because here in Georgia, people listen to country music. I don't, but I had to listen to it so I could understand some of their patterns and some of their theology. So you have to do that. Look widely at things. If you prefer one particular kind of news agency, look at another one every now and then to get a different perspective because people in your congregations have different perspectives too. Um, there's no monolithic congregation to my knowledge, no monolithic preacher. So we have to listen across the board. Uh, movies. Um, I know that Top Gun just blew away everybody this weekend, but there are also women that fly airplanes. So and jet, so uh, they kind of left them out of the movie. And so I have to look at some other things that tell me that there's there are other people that can be involved in that. So I just can't talk about Top Gun. I can talk about that and Da, 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 because there's somebody else that's represented over there. Uh, consider we already talked about your own life. Faith object, uh, something around you right now. Thank you, hidden figures. Thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, something that's close to you, that's your faith object. I want you, oh yes, Encanto. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, a faith object that's close to you. That's right, that something around you that tells about your faith. We have it. Okay, in case everybody can't see, put, put what the faith, just name it in the, somebody put a cross in, yes, put in the chat, Nana's cross, thank you. Heart, the hymnal, yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Big hand holding, yes, okay. Jesus, the community. Very good, the Ethiopian cross. Because sometimes, what's right next to you gives you what you need as an illustration at that moment. So you don't have to go through a whole bunch of old boxes. It's something that meant something to you. That means something to you and that's why it's close to you. It becomes your faith object. It doesn't mean you carry it around all the time, but it's something that says something about who you are. And having put your faith objects up there, I would like for you to put uh, in the chat a scripture that goes with the faith object you name. Ooh, a tie print of the creation. I'd love to see that. Psalm 70, thank you very much. All the Psalms, thank you. Genesis, to the diamond cross, the back of your neighbor. Thank you. Ah, oh, oh, I like that one, Chip. I preached that on Mother's Day, as a matter of fact. Thank you. Okay. Okay, one more. What do you see? Now, something happened very important in the in the in the chat that that is a perfect illustration of how sometimes we have to understand that we all have a hermeneutic. So some were seeing Noah, some were seeing judgment of nations, the power of creation. And so when we start describing our, we're presenting our illustrations in a sermon, please understand that some people, no matter how you're saying it, are going to perceive it differently. It doesn't mean you have to apologize for it. It just means that we all come at both faith and the text and an illustration from different vantage points. Illustrations are supposed to give us clarity. We pray that they're interesting. Uh, they, they are supposed to uh, intensify as they're illuminating, as we're earthing. It anchors the text in everyday life and experiences. It is, should be memorable, but not more memorable than the text and innovative. That means that don't use, when I mentioned earlier, these 1908 illustrations we're still using. Right, something that people can connect with. It, it sometimes challenges the intellect. It can affect, affect the emotional level of what's going on and it's to intensify but not manipulate. So it's to get rid of confusion. 
but to add clarity to what's going on. Because some of the ways, depending on what language translation you use when you're preaching, some of those things may be clouding for people um, or, or take them back someplace. When I was watching uh, the first two funerals in Texas, the, the caskets were plain. There was an article this weekend about a gentleman in Texas who's painting the caskets with children's scenes. And, and so there are two different ways now, the same act is taking place, but one is very vivid and one is very plain. The meaning is still the same, right? So you have to know those kinds of things. Uh, I repeatedly say this, I'm gonna do it again, that in making it plain, an illustration throws light, doesn't block out. It is to give us a multifaceted engagement of the text. And when you're using different translations, I'm sure that you all consult two or three different translations when you're writing a sermon. Um, sometimes the descriptors are different in the translations. So pay attention to that, what gives you the most vibrant, right? Uh, sometimes the text doesn't need any other illustration. The text just stands alone. You don't need to add from it. You don't need to, to, dis you don't have to add to it or distract from it, it's there. It's there's some very vibrant kind of descriptors in the book of Revelation, but also in some of those, the, the histories, those are very vibrant. Uh, the idea of Jael hammering a stake, you don't really need to improve on somebody hammering a stake in somebody's skull, it's there, right? You don't have to add that, right? Understand that it's listener-centered. We put the illustration together, but we also are using illustration so that the listener understands more about the text, all right? That's that pastoral movement. Uh, sometimes the illustration is underwhelming, which means you didn't need it in the first place. Uh, there are persons that will add an illustration just because they like it, but it may not have anything at all to do with the text. It again is contextually based. So know what illustrations work in your context. When we talk about uh, sermon transportability, uh, because I preach um, sometimes three times a week, but a minimum of six times a month, uh, I also preach in different contexts with different ethnicities and different denominations. And so the biblical text remains the same, but I have to filter my illustrations so that they meet the context. So no matter how wonderful someone has told me a sermon was, and sometime in between services in the same context, because there's a certain group, I, this, is, this is my, what I've experienced in these last 40 years. Uh, sometimes in, in the context in which I preach most often, the early service are people that are really bibliocentric. They want the word, they want it there. They go to Bible study, they show up for Sunday school. And the second service, there's sometimes people that kind of float in, right? And so I need a different kind of illustration from the people that I know have studied the text than the people that may not be as familiar with the text. So when I, the work I've done with the biblical text for the sermon stays the same, but I modify in between services to meet the needs of the listeners so they understand all that wonderful work that you did in your office. So please keep that in mind. And when you're going in between ethnicities, I have to, I have to consider the, the, the persons before me. And so I'm not saying, I don't have to spend three fourths of the sermon explaining an illustration instead of finding an illustration that fits that context. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? So it doesn't mean I don't care. Or, or when an event happens, there are younger preachers that say, you, if you don't preach about this on Sunday, you're not preaching. Well, I know the context. I know the people. This is not the time for me to talk about Evaldi. This is time, and maybe I've been talking about social justice, the because that's my thing, right? The entire time, so I don't have to go back and do it all over again. I know my people. On, on Pentecost Sunday, whatever's happening, people are gonna want you to talk about Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one. So in other parts of the service, I might address something that's a current event, but I'm not going to try to force that into a sermon 
on a liturgical text because somebody else is going to be ticked off because I don't. Do you, I, I got kind of emotional about that, but yeah. <laughs> I got invested in that right there. Okay. All right. Um, whatever you do, avoid making the biblical text the subtext of the illustration. The illustration supports the biblical text. The biblical text does not support the illustration. So even if I find this wonderful illustration, I don't need to force a biblical text on it. I need to look for the biblical text that actually speaks to what's in the illustration. You, you see what I'm saying? Because you can tell they're disjointed pieces if you're trying to force it up under there, right? Okay, what do you see? And we're going to start by what you see and put a biblical text with it real quick. Agape, wonderful. Abundance, yes, 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 yes. Okay, peace. Mm -hmm. Grocery ad, yes, it was. Thank you very much, John. Uh huh. Love peace, okay. All right. Describe the movement you see in the left-hand picture. What do you see in the left-hand picture in terms of movement? Oosh, okay. Rest of, thank you very much, Reverend Carmen, because I don't do these at all for that reason, okay? Force and intensity and speed, okay? Right hand. Uh, what do you, what, let's see, what do you taste on the right hand side? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Fibers, yes. Okay. There are different kinds of illustrations. There are biblical illustrations that you can take right out of the text, like Miriam and Exodus 14. There are historical illustrations, you know, uh, biographical, biographical illustrations. This is one of those. Um, Fred Craddock uh, said that one has to be careful when one is using biographical illustrations not to, to always choose the quote unquote perfect person, uh, the hero, the heroine. So I have the students preach the background characters. So if I'm going to use something that's a person, a biographical kind of thing, the little boy's lunch, that, that text, it's someplace in the book. I know all you preachers know where it is. I have them preach the little boy's mother because she packed the lunch. It was a poor person's lunch. And so what happens when he comes back home and says, guess what happened to my lunch? Right? It, or, or I would have them preach as the cross and not about the cross. Mm. Okay. What does the cross feel? What does the cross smell? What does it feel like to have death on you? Those kinds of things, right? Uh, humorous, we've talked about humorous, keep it tasteful, uh, scientific things like biology, life science, computer kind of stuff, and cultural kinds of illustrations. Those are all there. The, what you see in this picture, I don't know if any of you know, this is called the harp. Augusta Savage uh, put this together for a world's fair and it was burned. This is the only picture of it and it was burned. Uh, and she did a wood casting of it. So before it could even be in ceramic, it's a wood casting. Uh, so a cultural kind of piece. And what she is putting with this is um, uh, lift every voice and sing is what she used as the, uh, the piece for it. And all these little bodies and stuff that you see here and people all singing, right? Being held in God's hand. So there's some cultural things that can go with text. So think about your culture or the culture at the church or the culture in the city? And what is there that people know about that you can use as an illustration, which, which then when they pass it, they will remember 
the biblical text, right? It's supposed to be memorable, something they can relate to, okay? So we have biblical, historical, biographical, humorous, scientific, cultural. Uh, you can Google just about anything. People Google God all the time, but you can Google just about anything. Uh, make sure you check the sources, like when you're looking at biblical texts, when you're doing exegesis, to make sure it's actually a thing, right? Uh, make sure you know who put the information up there in the first place and that it's, that it's the illustration that you need, okay? Uh, okay, cultural illustrations also include uh, things from game shows. My favorite all-time one is Jeopardy. So one uh, Good Friday, I preached uh, about Jeopardy. It was called Double Jeopardy. Uh, yeah, so, so you can use the game shows and, and I walk through what happens in Jeopardy and then the double Jeopardy thing. And then you bet it all and you win all that kind of stuff. Anyway, game shows, popular works of fiction. When I say popular works of fiction, again, in your context, what's popular? In your context, what's, 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 what's classical literature? And, and because you loved a book doesn't mean somebody else loves a book. So I love uh, to watch uh, procedural dramas. I love mysteries, but not everybody likes a mystery, even though faith is a mystery, but that's neither here nor there, right? And so what do other people do, right? Or uh, one of my students did a whole series of sermons in my class on Dr. Seuss books, Oh, the Places We Will Go, right? And so I hadn't read it, but when she started doing it, it made me want to go get the book and read. Dr. Seuss because my child was grown. So it had been a long time since Dr. Seuss or Peanuts had visited my house. So I went back and looked at it, but think about all the colors even with that, right? So she stood and held the book, just the book, didn't open it while she was preaching. And so you get a tend to that or the cat in the hat, right? So all those colors are bringing things in when she's talking about those things. Um, Excuse me, Dr. Freiburn. Yes. There's a question in the chat for you. Oh, I'm sorry. And cultural stories sometimes hard sometimes with a wide range. Okay, with a wide range in the in the congregation, you have a sermon where you can. I don't know if you do those three point sermons. I don't do those. Use a different illustration. You have different people, so instead of doing five on one point, for the next point, use a different culture. This is called reaching each age. So the first one, I have this general demographic, I'm going to use this. The second one, I'm doing this demographic, I'm going to use this, and then look for universals. There are some things, regardless of our cultural differences that everybody goes through. If everybody goes through. And so you look for, you look for human illustrations and not necessarily just cultural illustrations. Does that make sense? Who put that up there? Is it Julie? Julie? Yeah, it's me. I think okay. sometimes like explaining uh, social media, sometimes like, like there's something that most people saw on social media, my congregation, but a lot of people might not be on it, you know, so addressing that, but you know, how do we, so when I say food everyone without making it tedious for those who know? It, it's the economy of words becomes important. I would say there was this thing on TikTok I don't know if you saw it, and I'll explain just a little bit of it. And then the next time I don't do TikTok, I do whatever is mundane, uh, re you know, reels or something of that nature. Or I use something from a book later on because I use repetition. So when I bring something up again, I'll use a different thing relating to it. And, and uh, some, because of the variety of ages in the congregation, um, not everybody still has, some people still have Androids. I have an iPhone. So I have to remember Android people want to understand my iPhone reference. So I have to go look up an Android reference so they'll get it because I've already addressed the people that have the iPhones. You know what I'm saying? So if I'm talking about um, uh, the, the beauty of, no, let's see. Uh, somebody give me a text and I can tell you how to do it. Can you give me a, just a, a comment? Pentecost. And, oh, thank you. That, thank you, Julie. Thank you. It was right there in front of me, right? Uh, all in one place on one accord. That's fine if people are in person. 
but we also have to do an illustration for the people that are now in hybrid spaces. And we have to do an illustration about the people that are on the phone, right? So we, so all in one place in one accord does not necessarily mean physical. It may be this kind of mental kind of spiritual kind of connection that we have with each other. So we have to do that sometime too. Does that make, does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? All in one place on one accord. And when I talk about all in one place on one accord, uh, we have, uh, I do this whole thing about when I was growing up, but I have to remember that not everybody grew up like I did. We had to be on Sunday dinner. Everybody had to be at the table at one time. But there came a time when there was a children's table and an adult table. We were all in one place, but we weren't all on one accord. Because sometimes we set up separate tables, seating. So it really wasn't a Pentecost experience, even though the whole family was in the, the house at the same time, right? So people that ever had to sit at the children's table were like, yes. And the people that got bored at the adult table go, yes. And then the people that like to have the adult table go, yes, the children should be over there. But there's a way to, you know, there's a way to explain it so that you consider those different facets, right? There's, a, there's, a, there's an illustration, it's called the facet illustration, where you take off different pieces, right? And so you have to, you can't cover all of them because you'll be in church for a long time. And so, sermons should be really short these days. Uh, I don't mean real short, but not the hour sermons that some people used to preach. Okay, I know all of you preach about 45 minutes, but I'm, you know, God bless your hearts. Um, oh, that's, that's also like assuming that I, I love sports. I love sports. I love sports. And for people to assume that as a woman, I have, I mean, I'm a season ticket holder to the Falcons, pray for me. And, and I love football, but for people to do an illustration, then say, well, women want to understand this or men cook and men take care of babies. And so that's that, that parsing to understand that an illustration may work better than we think it does. But we have these, these cultural understandings of groups that sometimes override the veracity of the illustration. Right? Uh, so that becomes important. So emblems, fashion kinds of things, advertisements. Uh, you can do, I, I, have a, I did a whole class on uh, homiletical resources, but also I have a, a class on preaching and popular culture. So we use advertisements and the ads and, and TikTok and Reel and all those other kinds of things and music and different types of music. Someone mentioned uh, uh, Kendrick Lamar earlier, different type of music that goes. And when you study music music, one would understand that the difference is not necessarily what's being addressed, it's how the language is used to address it now. So you could use, actually you could put, you could parallel music from say the 50s with some of the contemporary music if you look at the right song. Protest music is not new, it's how it's articulated that is new. So you can do those kinds of things. And the truth of the matter is, even though I have difficulty listening to country and Western music, it's the same kind of human stuff going on in R&B, the language and the rhythms are different. Yeah. Um, oh, I know I'm not gonna have time to put you in things. Uh, okay, uh, sound, we're back in the chat now, sound. Quiet, good. If you could touch, what is the texture? And I don't mean I don't mean to poke the line and let it eat you. I don't mean that. But if you could touch the fur, what is the texture? Soft, fluffy, furry, scratchy. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, text would be too easy, right? Somebody's going to put line of Judah. So we won't do that right now because I only have 13 minutes. Okay. Illustration resources are everywhere. And I've talked about some of those. We've done those, those things. Talk to children. Watch children. Ask children about God. One of the things I always find very interesting in, in my 40 years of ministry, and I was Christian education director before that and a choir director, is how much adults get into children's sermons. And then when it comes time to theirs, they're just bored as 
they can be, <clears throat> but how much they get into children's sermons because they like puppets and they like sounds and they like music and you break it down so where they can understand it. Okay, talk to the elders, right? Um, my grandmother, when she was 94, talked about old people, right? Uh, <laughs> but she, she, those old people, I got, Mom Tessie, you're 94, right? But uh, uh, talk to, listen to people because they've experienced what you're talking about in the biblical text. Think about life passages and things that go on in daily life, uh, music and all that stuff, church life and observe people. I, uh, when we were able to get out, I would send my students to shopping centers to watch people, to watch interactions of people, not to talk to them, not to be voyeuristic, but just to watch, to look at how humans interact with each other or avoid each other, to look at body language. And when you are preaching, watch the congregation. Don't just convert your manuscript, but watch the congregation because you can tell how things change or how, what the, the emotional temperature is by watching while you're preaching. So when I've been preaching on screen, watching those little boxes, you, you, the reason that preacher, many preachers have expressed to me they're so tired on Sunday is because watching you in little boxes is more taxing than watching in person because it's a flat screen, even though I can see your head moving. And so our stimulus is different at this time. I can loan out my children. Yes, Julie, that's fine. Yes. Yes, how many? Two, okay. What are their ages? Eight and 12. Thank you. That would be <laughs> fine. My daughter is, a, is, a, is an um, assistant principal for middle school. She would be in seventh heaven. I have taught adults for so long, I relish the time with children. So mm -hmm. that, might, that might work for me. Uh, yes, uh, Lance? raise your hand. I, I wanted to share with you very briefly that when you said watch, talk to children. This last Sunday, I had an opportunity to baptize a baby. Mm. And when it came time for the children's sermon, I asked the kids, what is baptism? Huh? And I was absolutely stunned when a little boy raised his hand and in about two sentences, summed up exactly what baptism was. Yes. I was just stunned. And I turned around and I looked at the rest of the congregation. And I said, and that, ladies and gentlemen, was the children's sermon. That's Thank good. you very much. Let's pray. <laughs> That's good. That's that very cool. cool. I, I love that because um, the, when I say talk with children and, and because they pay attention more than we do, and sometimes our attitudes are so jaded we lose stuff, right? Uh, because we have all this stuff pressing down on us. And, and so I think that's the beauty of all of these things, the observation of children, okay? The observation of children. Uh, I have about eight minutes, so let me do this. Um, if we're using media in preaching, make sure that the theology, the themes in the clip are similar to yours. Because if not, you're going to have a whole lot of work to do after the sermon. Know how to come in to the clip and how to come out of the clip so it's not just hanging. Test your, your, your meet with your meet your IT folks before. See what they, you all are aware of wing clips. Wing clips. Let me put it in the chat. I think I can do this with that. With that. Wing clips, does anybody? Go online and look up wing clips. Um, it is this compendium of movie clips. And then there's a drop down menu that has themes and text. And they are less than because you, you know, they have to be one to three minutes or there's a whole copyright situation. You can buy a clip or you can use the clips. There's some free clips. And then you can have a subscription where you can actually own the clip. Um, and 
um, it, it goes through themes, characters, biblical texts, all of those kinds of things, but it's wonderful for both Bible study and I've used it in sermons. I did a workshop on for evangelism and there's this scene in the movie Harriet where her family's standing and the, and the water's in front of her and she just starts walking into the water. And once she gets so far in the water, then they begin to follow her. And that in the middle of COVID, that's what ministry was. We can't see what was on the other side, but we're walking toward the water, just like the going Abrahamic, going not knowing kind of situation. So I bought the clip, but wing clips has been, I've been using it for years for both teaching and all these other kinds of things, but just go on and look at it and see what you think about it. Some of the movies are brand new, they're cartoon, you know, anime, cartoons, all these kinds of things uh, in all kinds of genres of, of movies, but they just give you a little clip and, and a bit of the, so the dialogue and then they can relate a text to it. But this is a, a wonderful site, I think. Uh, biblical text is applicable. How would you use it in a sermon or Bible study? And are there uh, problems with it? Conflict. So I've also used some that caused some in a Bible study that caused me pause that I've put up and we discuss things in Bible study. When I've done interreligious kind of Bible studies to help people understand what other faith systems use, then I'll put a clip up and we talk it through because it's another visual that's needed sometimes. So, so visual moving, oh, I have six minutes. Okay, uh, I teach a lot, so I always over-prepare, so please forgive me. Uh, last thing, we won't have time to do exercises. Things to avoid and then I'll be finished. Don't trust your memory on an illustration, particularly a new illustration. Uh, try not to use canned illustrations. That's why I've been working on how you can develop your own, okay? Uh, try not to use plagiarism. Don't tell somebody else's story and say it's yours, okay? Make sure it's your stuff, right? Uh, try not to do the big fish illustrations hyperbole, just, just clean illustrations. And if someone has said something to you, I know you already watch, watch confidentiality, so I don't have to pay attention to that, right? If somebody's told you something, do not use it. Try not to use your children, Julie's. Try not to use your children or your spouse or your partner in an illustration without their permission and sometimes not at all. Uh, PKs suffer a lot because parents want to use them all the time in an illustration, right? Uh, and do not represent a story as true if it's not true. Please don't, because people will Google you while you're telling the story and then your authenticity is lost, okay? Um, and watch the I illustration. Our lives are excellent illustrations because we've done it, but try not to always be the, the focus of a story or an illustration. And finally, um, if you're using an illustration, you begin to lose focus, stop the illustration, go to the next point. Right. Don't apologize for the illustration. You can tell when you are preaching if something's making sense or if you're connected. It's okay to, to, to learn how to segue to something else. It's really okay. And now I have four minutes and I'm going to stop right now and see if there's a question, I'm so sorry. I get too excited, that's just me. I'll stop sharing. Okay, I'm back. Okay. Uh, I think we have time for one question. Yes, that the baptism is visual and tactile. I like that. Uh, sometimes Christian members. Okay. Okay, Chip. There you go. I'm done. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. This is some happy hands. It was so, you just gave us so much to think about. As you were talking, I was kind of cataloging illustrations that um, did not go as well as I hoped. And you gave me some input to help me understand that and to help me preach better. And I know in the future, and I know that was the case for everyone. So thank you so very, very much. We're really grateful that you spent the time this morning with us and um, just um, know that our preaching ministries will be strengthened because you spent time with us today. So thank you. Um, again, for everybody, we have a um, break in July, and then we'll be back at it in August with preaching in the um, face of trauma. 
and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. With the pandemic, there has been trauma writ large, and then of course there is trauma um, in very urgent ways as we've seen in the last couple of weeks too. So um, thank you, I look forward to that. And that concludes our programming for today. So I'll stop the recording and let you all go on for the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Oh, Teresa, you'll have to stop the recording, actually, since you're the host now.